Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be totally not sort of Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit How I Learned to Fly. This one was a bit of an outlier in the Goosebumps formula. We have a main character who is crushing hard versus the usual platonic boy-girl dynamic. It also lacks any scares in the traditional sense. I still found parts of it enjoyable, but would have been fine never reading it. It's not one I can strongly recommend, it's just kind of there. This 1997 cover features some classic red converse and lets the reader know that yes, this kid is actually going to fly in this story. Aside from that, the cover is a little dull, but given the source material, it's kind of to be expected. I mean, Jacobus did give the seagulls evil red eyes, so he tried his best here. The 2006 slime border brightens the image as per usual and switches the colors from ugly brown and light purple to blue and orange, which I think is an improvement in this case. I really didn't like the purple and brown of the original and thought it was even uglier in my title card intro this week. Again, there wasn't any additional merchandise aside from our usual trading card book tear out and a metallic sticker of the cover and of Curly. Our front take says, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's a kid, which is obviously a play on the iconic Superman tagline. Our back take says, he's got his head in the clouds, for real. And given the cover image and title, I'm not sure we needed the for real clarifier, but let's check out the blurb on the back. Wilson Schlame loves to make Jack Johnson feel like a total loser, and Jack's had it. That's how he ended up down at the beach, in a creepy old abandoned house, in the dark, trying to hide from Wilson. But everything's about to change, because Jack just dug up the coolest book. It's called Flying Lessons. It tells how humans can learn to fly. Poor Jack, he wanted to get back at Wilson. But now that Jack's learned to fly, things down on Earth are getting really scary. Okay, on to the summary. The book opens with our introduction to Jack Johnson, the boy, not the singer, and he is preoccupied with Wilson Schlame. Wilson is a hyper-competitive borderline jerk who always seems to be out to get Jack, and Wilson acts even more aggressive when our love interest Mia is around. We seem to have a little love triangle situation going on here, because it's clear Jack has a giant crush on Mia, and this feels like the first time a character is showing actual interest in another character, because usually Goosebumps protagonists are strictly platonic. Jack spends an entire page swooning over Mia, and seems to love everything about her, right down to the fact that she was even born on Valentine's Day and is obsessed with hearts in the color red. Like seriously, everything this girl wears and interacts with involves hearts and the color red, to an almost unhealthy level. Think Marie and Purple in Breaking Bad. Wilson also seems to have taken a liking to Mia, and seems to do everything in his power to make Jack look bad in front of Mia. Throughout this book, Mia seems to kinda love and thrive off the attention of the two boys fighting for her, and it's uncomfortable. In addition to loving Mia, Jack also loves superheroes. He seems to spend all of his free time creating and drawing new superheroes such as the Incredible Laser Man, the Fearless Falcon, Shadow Boy, and the Masked Mantis. I feel like we heard one of these in The Masked Mutant, but I'm too lazy to go back and confirm. I just remember one that had Mantis in it. After class at Malibu Middle School, he goes to hand Mia a superhero drawing he made for her when he is shoved roughly from behind by Wilson and sent flying into a desk. He looks over and watches with contempt as Wilson hands Mia not just a picture of one superhero, but five superheroes lovingly labeled Mia's protectors. Jack is disappointed that Mia loves Wilson's drawing and dismisses Jack's picture as cute and heads out the door. Jack then remembers he has another opportunity to impress Mia with his new 21 speed bike. I think this boy needs to take a cold shower. He heads outside and spots Mia admiring the new bike, but is immediately one-upped by Wilson's new heavy-duty dirt bike, which Mia seems to like more. Wilson then challenges Jack to a race, and Jack of course loses. At Jack's house, his Cocker Spaniel Morty marches out to greet the kids because he loves Mia just as much as Jack does. Two things here. One, Morty is a great dog's name. Two, it's been a long time since we've had a Goosebumps Cocker Spaniel. At the start of this series, it seemed like every other kid had a Cocker Spaniel. Wilson appears with his Labrador Terminator, and the two boys have a pissing contest over whose dog is smarter. I wouldn't want to spend any time around any of these people. Two kids who are constantly in a battle to one-up each other, and one who seems to enjoy watching it. These would be the most exhausting friends to have. Wilson wins the smartest dog contest by saying they taught Terminator how to answer the phone, and I'd want to see the receipts because I call bullshit on that one. The kids suddenly hear their elderly neighbor crying for help because their kitten is stuck up in a tree, so I'm sure you can see where this is going. Jack races Wilson to the tree in the everlasting quest to impress Mia. Jack gets to the tree first and scrambles up it smugly because now it's his time to shine as Wilson waits at the bottom of the trunk. The only issue is, just as he's about to reach the kitten, he slips and falls right out of the tree in a chapter cliffhanger. He braces for impact, but is mortified when he lands softly in Wilson's open arms like a little baby. Mia cheers for Wilson and then Wilson plops Jack onto the pavement and onto his head. Wilson then confidently climbs the tree and saves the kitten flawlessly. I think Jack is just going to have to accept his place on the totem pole at this point. Wilson is just a winner. Jack then notices Terminator beating the shit out of Morty because even the dogs have the same toxic dynamic going on as their owners. 
Mia reminds Jack of her upcoming birthday party on Saturday, and he tries to think of an excuse not to go because he hates parties since it's just another opportunity for Wilson to outdo him. Jack says he can't go, he has to help his dad clean out the basement, but Wilson interjects, that's a lie, because he did that last weekend, when poor, feeble Jack needed big, strong Wilson to help carry the heavy trash out for him. Why would Wilson be helping clean out Jack's basement? Are these boys frenemies? What a weird relationship. Jack agrees to attend the party, and then ominously narrates, So on Saturday, I went to Mia's party, and wouldn't you know it, it ruined my life forever. But he's still alive to tell this tale, so it can't be that bad. We jump to the party, and right off the bat, Jack's off to a rough start. Mia's stepmom enthusiastically greets Jack at the door and is like, Oh my god, you're finally here! Everyone is so excited to see you! Except she thinks Jack is Wilson, so when she finds out he's not Wilson, she's like, Oh. Well, okay. Have fun. The kids all start playing with red balloons and are having a great time. Wilson arrives and immediately grabs the balloons and twirls them together in a sculpture of their gym teacher. That seems really random to me, but that's what he does, and shocker, Mia loves it. She even says, isn't Wilson a riot? He can do anything. Anything is in italics, so Mia is not being subtle here. She wants Wilson. Wilson continues to entertain the crowd with his balloon talents by making a pig with antlers, a tiny elephant with a four-foot trunk, and an enormous chicken. Just in time for chicken chicken next week. Mia announces it's time for Twister, and Jack is filled with dread because there is no way this ends well for him. He tries to be in charge of the spinner, but Wilson commands Terminator to spin the spinner, forcing Jack to join the game. So yes, this dog is suddenly at the party and manning the spinner, just go with it. This results in Jack ripping the back of his shorts open and exposing the room to his Superman underwear. Jack tries to flee the party, but Mia convinces him to stay by letting him borrow a pair of her brother's shorts. I think I would've just gone home at this point. We then have a very symbolic scene at the dinner table, where Jack gets ready to eat his small hot dog, when Wilson smugly whips out a foot-long hot dog. I think that speaks for itself. It's then present opening time, and Mia loves Jack's present, a CD by the band Purple Rose. I feel like the Goosebumps kids exclusively give out CDs at birthday parties. Wilson went up to this present by giving Mia two tickets to see Purple Rose in concert at the Hollywood Bowl. This gift causes Jack to snap. He screams and literally runs out of the house. Imagine this happening in real life, a kid just standing up screaming and racing out of the house down the street because he can't handle the superior boy anymore. The party just doesn't go on though, because as Jack is racing down the hill towards the ocean, he turns to see the entire party in hot pursuit of him, so he decides to hide in an abandoned beach mansion. I love that the party is following him, and just not letting him have his mental breakdown in peace. Eventually the kids give up their search and Jack is left to explore the abandoned beach house. He doesn't get far before falling through the kitchen floor in a chapter cliffhanger. He's able to locate a flashlight down in the basement and immediately spots a trunk in the corner. He opens it up and finds a book titled Flying Lessons. He flips through it expecting pictures of planes, but it's just pictures of people attempting to fly. He's then interrupted by a sea of rats charging at him in another chapter cliffhanger. These rats really come out of nowhere, but again, just go with it. Jack's able to escape by literally shaking the rats from his shorts, stomping on their tails, and then fleeing up the basement stairs. Jack makes it back home and hides the book in an old mattress in his garage. His dad is a hoarder, so he has ample hiding places in this garage. We then jump to the next morning, with Jack's parents revealing they won't be back until later that night, so there's ample time for flying, I hope. Stein really is leaning into this Hollywood setting because Jack's parents are talent agents and have to go watch a new band perform in Anaheim. Jack is home alone playing frisbee with the dog when Mia calls and asks him to go rollerblading, which he's down for until he realizes Wilson is coming too, so he says he can't and has to water the plants. He decides to check out his new flying book and is astonished to learn that this book can teach him how to fly. All he needs to do are some arm exercises, make a potion, and do a magical chant. The book even has the motto, learn the motion, eat the potion. Learning the motion will help with Jack's hot dog situation. Jack crafts the potion and begins working on flying exercises, but these are a bit more challenging than he anticipated. At one point he has to put his left foot on his right shoulder and then tuck his right leg behind his head. I like yoga, and I am nowhere close to being able to do these things, but Jack is determined and pulls it off. While twisted like a pretzel, Jack suddenly realizes he's no longer alone. It turns out his friends Ethan and Ray just let themselves in the house and have stumbled across Jack in a precarious situation. Jack spends a few pages awkwardly trying to get these boys to leave before they finally get the hint and Jack can get back to his flying lessons. He says the magic words, Hishram, Hishmar, Shah, Sharom, Sham, and jumps off a chair, only to land on the ground with a thud. This is because he forgot to eat the potion, which is like, duh Jack. This potion is more of a dough though because it contains 10 eggs, 1 tablespoon of maple syrup, 2 cups of flour, half a cup of seltzer, and 4 tablespoons of yeast, and a packet of mystery blue dust from an envelope attached to the book. After adding the magic dust, the dough gets very monster bloody by bubbling, turning green, and throbbing. Jack decides he's not eating this shit and goes to throw it in the trash. The phone rings and it's his parents letting him know they're going to head back early. When he turns around he spots Morty helping himself to some of the mixture, again just like in Monster Blood. This mixture is like Monster Blood's cousin. Stein should have just made Kermit the main character on this one instead of Jack. 
Trigger could have replaced Morty as our Cocker Spaniel even. Jack chases Morty into the living room, but the Cocker Spaniel starts to float off the ground and out of the house. Jack follows him and is horrified when he sees Morty floating away like a balloon. He races inside and starts wolfing down the mixture, which is hot and sour and not pleasant. After eating the whole bowl, he runs back outside and is confused when he's unable to fly. We spend a few pages with Jack hopping around his backyard trying to fly and failing. That is until he has an intense burp and takes off flying. It's like the reverse of the fizzy lifting drinks in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Which, by the way, that scene used to stress me out as a kid. What's it making, Mr. Wonka? Fizzy lifting drinks. Oh, isn't it high? Gosh! Mmm, not bad. But, ah! Oh! Oh! We're in big trouble! Mr. Wonka is gonna like this! Why not? I can't stop! It's pulling me in! There's nothing to grab onto! Help! We're gonna get killed! We then spend a few pages with Jack trying to steer his flying before he's finally able to rescue a terrified Morty who doesn't know what the fuck is happening to him. Except now that Jack has Morty safely in his arms, he has no idea how to get back down because he can only go up and drift on air currents. Eventually, he realizes he can steer by just pointing his arms and enjoys a few pages sailing over Malibu. He wants to show Mia his new powers and heads home, but he needs to hide from his parents, who may have spotted him in the sky in a chapter cliffhanger. Except, not really, they just saw an interesting bird near the garage. Jack weighs down Morty with a leash and a rock, because poor Morty can't seem to get a handle on this flying situation and retreats to his doghouse. In the house, Jack explains the massive mess in the kitchen as a science experiment gone wrong, so his flying secret is still safe. The next morning, we waste a few pages with Jack trying to sneak out early to practice flying, but he gets interrupted by his dad, who is also up early because his latest client is a chimpanzee who can knit sweaters in under 10 minutes, and he has a phone call with the owner. This is an odd book. Jack is unable to practice flying that morning, and so, with a few pages successfully filled with bullshit, we jump to after school. He spots Mia with Wilson, who is showing off his rollerblading skills. Jack jumps out of his bedroom window in an attempt to impress her with the power of flight, but he just lands in the bushes instead. Having successfully survived defenestration, he awkwardly has to face Mia and Wilson and denies falling out of the window, despite them just watching it happen. He gets ready to show off his flying ability, but we have more page filler instead with him being interrupted by his mom right before takeoff. She wants Jack to clean up the closet and to check on Morty since he won't leave his doghouse. Jack suspects Morty is terrified of floating away, and the kids plan to meet the following afternoon to see Jack's new trick. Except, we cannot escape page filler in this book, because the following afternoon it's storming out and Jack doesn't want to fly in it. Then, this repeats for the next three days. This book is not interesting enough to be building up any sort of suspense. I'm just annoyed and want to get on with my Saturday at this point, but it's only page 71, so freedom is still a ways out. The following Friday, Mia has a dentist appointment, and then on Saturday and Sunday, Jack has a project to complete for school. Isn't this all just thrilling? Totally worth its own chapter. An entire week passes where it's too rainy for Jack to fly. Wear a fucking rain jacket at this point, my god. Stein thinks reading about flying would just be too dull. He'd much rather add some pages on how Jack got a 97 on his term paper, but Wilson got a 98, as if Wilson's superiority hasn't been hammered on enough. This book is called How I Learned to Fly, and we have like three pages of this kid flying at a 75. But yes, Stein, tell me how Wilson has been to New York four times, for vacation. That's the kind of content I came for. Finally, the kids are in the park together, and Jack challenges Wilson to a race. He agrees, and it's actually time for Jack to fly. They take off running, and Jack soars into the sky but his excitement is short-lived because he looks over and sees Wilson is flying too. Jack is so distressed that he crashes head first into a tree trunk as Wilson soars around with ease. Wilson reveals he watched Jack fly the first time and snuck into his garage to borrow the flying book, so now they can both fly. That's a bit contrived, but whatever, at least stuff is happening now. Wilson and Jack fly around together for a bit trying to impress Mia, but this just ends up with Jack crashing into a flagpole after Wilson outmaneuvers him. Wilson heads off to tennis lessons, so Mia begs Jack to teach her how to fly. He thinks this is finally a chance to bond with Mia, but when he gets to his garage to locate the flying book, he's horrified to discover the garage has been cleared out and the book is nowhere to be found. Mia thinks maybe this is for the best since flying can be dangerous and wants Jack to stop flying too, but he's not into that idea and goes for a little late night flight. This part of the book is actually pleasant where Stein describes Jack flying around the city and having a grand old time. It's not scary in any way, but at least it's interesting enough. This all comes to a screeching halt though when he realizes he's lost track of where he floated off to and is completely lost. For some reason, Jack decides he should land and be lost on the ground instead, so he wanders aimlessly until he comes across a cop car and asks how to get back to Malibu. The cops let him know he's pretty far from Malibu and are confused on how he ended up so far away from home. Jack realizes he didn't think this through and doesn't want to get dropped off at home by the cops, so he flies into the sky while the cops watch awestruck. 
He follows the freeway back to Malibu and sneaks back into his house where he gets a phone call from Wilson about a race at school the next day. It's pretty easy to guess what's going to happen here. We spend a chapter with Jack debating whether he should race or not, with Mia begging him not to, but he does it anyways. In front of the entire school, Jack and Wilson have a flying race. The two boys expect to be met with applause, but the school is just in stunned silence. In class, everybody is whispering about Jack and seems to be somewhat afraid of him. I don't get these kids' responses. I would think the flying kid is awesome. Jack gets called down to the school office where he's greeted by the government agents and a scientist from a university because they want to take him to a lab and do some experiments on him and maybe use him as a secret weapon. Jack is not into this idea at all and races out of the school and heads home, where he's met by two very angry parents who want to know why he kept the secret for so long. But not for safety reasons, because these two talent agent parents want to pimp their kid out as a child star. We jump to an unknown date and Jack is promoting a car dealership in a metallic superhero costume his mom made for him. His parents are thrilled to see TV crews because they think the next stop for Jack is movies and action figures. The next week, Jack's days are filled with interviews with various journalists and he's sad he can't hang out with his friends. His parents are also going classic stage parent and force him to work out 24-7 and only do things that will advance his career, so goodbye childhood for Jack. On his day off, he can't even just go outside to hang out with his friends without his mom forcing him to wear his superhero costume. Consistent branding is important, Jack. The moral of this story is leaning towards don't have shitty, money-hungry parents. Jack flips on the TV and spots Wilson in a superhero costume of his own on Wonder Wilson and His Amazing Rescues. Jack is in shock because he's busy shooting commercials for used cars, and Wilson already has a TV show of his own, because like we've established approximately a thousand times, Wilson wins at everything. There's then a knock at the door, when Jack opens it he spots two large army men who demand he comes with them. They rush him off to some sort of government lab where they ask him hundreds of questions and force him to fly in various positions. Just when he thinks he's done, they take him back to an interrogation room and demand how to make the secret formula, but he can't remember it. He then begins to suspect his parents have no idea where he's at, but actually, his parents know, they just forgot to tell him because they've been too busy booking him for TV commercials. Jack's released back to his parents, who are excited to announce they've entered him in a race against Wilson for $1 million, and this actually intrigues Jack despite how miserable he's been so far, with being moderately famous. He goes outside to take a walk and to think about the race when he's swarmed with fans wanting pictures and autographs, so he's forced to hide in some bushes until they're gone, and then he contemplates if he really wants to fame and fortune. It's then the day of the big race and Jack is once again swarmed with fans. This time they break down a barricade and almost crush Jack in a horde where he thinks he's going to suffocate in a sea of people. This last fifth of the book is kind of redeeming itself because it's fun getting to see a wish play out as a nightmare for Jack. At the starting line, Jack finally gets to chat with Wilson, who is absolutely loving all of this attention and doesn't seem to be suffering at all like Jack is. The race consists of a flight to the Hollywood sign and back and with a gunshot, they're off. Except suddenly, Jack can't fly. He hops up and down and tells the disappointed crowd it's just not working, so Wilson wins the race. Jack returns to his old life and is perfectly happy because he and Mia get to spend a lot of time together since Wilson is too busy flying all over the planet and being famous. It's revealed on the last couple pages Jack didn't really lose his ability to fly, which I think was supposed to be a shock, but I literally thought we were supposed to interpret it that way at the race, that he was just faking it to be free of the fame. But that's how this one ends. Jack can still fly around and secretly does over Malibu some nights, and he wishes nothing but the best for Wilson. And I'm like, boo. I'm not here for character growth and sincerity. Like I mentioned last week, there's no episode pairing for this book, nor the next one, so we're continuing the trilogy with part two's Strike Three, You're Doomed. They should have saved that title for the third episode, but let's check it out. It looks like Matthew still has his little dumpster diving toy from last episode. I'm guessing this boy wants to be a sports superstar. Let's see how Carl ruins his life. It's gone! The Tigers win the championship! The crowd is going wild! I love that the kid just calls himself the star. Evans, sit down. Run the star. Now! This is like my experience with baseball as a kid. Close your eyes. Maybe you'll get lucky. Strike three! Batters out! At least his parents were supportive. Baseball's not the most important thing in the world. Okay, good. Something is happening. This intro went on a little long. Charlesville League. It's a whole new ball game. Carl looks less plasticky in this episode. That's why they call it Little League. So you all my team or what? Tonight's the big game. Everyone's come out to watch. It's feeling a bit ghosty in this baseball field. It is a beautiful night for a game. Another episode saved by an actor willing to be ridiculous. Carl. 
magic is afoot. I know how to play. We'll see. This looks potentially dangerous. Here come some special effects. I can do that. This feels too real. You're trying to hurt me. Quit whining. No wonder you never get to play. This episode is just kind of weird. I think I preferred the pig girl from last week. Ah! Ah! I'm glad he finally realized he could take off his shoes. Hey, remember that. Give it here. More special effects. I'm trying to figure out what this has to do with baseball or what happened to this kid earlier. It goes on for like a solid minute though. Now we have random demons. You want some more players? <laughs> it's a Langolier. I have no idea what lesson this kid learned. No! Jump scare. Alright, let's set up part three. What is that doing here? We've got to destroy this thing right away. I'm no kidding. Special delivery! Overall, I thought How I Learned to Fly was different, but not in a way I found particularly enjoyable. I was honestly kind of bored for most of this book, but I did enjoy the scenes with Jack flying over Malibu in the ocean, largely because some of my favorite dreams are basically just me flying around. It was also interesting that the scares in this book were centered around the downsides of fame and fortune, which isn't particularly relatable to most kids, but it was fun getting to see the fantasy turn into a nightmare. However, None of that makes up for the ungodly amount of page filler this book had. I'm gonna give this one 2 out of 5 seagulls. I appreciate the change of pace, but it was just so dull for about 80% of this book. Okay, on to our totals. How I Learned to Fly didn't have any vomit, pranks, asshole victims, shoulder scares, or it was only a dreams, but it did have some 90s moments. In Getting Jiggy with the 90s, we had four 90s moments. These included big old 90s hair scrunchies, a dog named Terminator, CDs, and rollerblading. This raises our goosebumps total to 161 jiggy 90s moments. How We Learned to Fly had the typical amount of cliffhangers, with a total of 12 chapter cliffhangers. I was impressed Stein was able to squeeze as many as he did given the content of the story. This raises our goosebumps series total to 642. There's no clunky cliffhanger award because I didn't find any of these cliffhangers to be that ridiculous, just dull at worst. Shocker ending. There was no twist ending to this book. Jack is happy he's spending more time with Mia and wishes nothing but the best for Wilson, who seems to be loving his life of fame and fortune. This leaves our Goosebumps series total at 43. Well that's it for How I Learned to Fly. I can see why people are divided on this one. I didn't find it terrible enough to actively hate it, it just didn't deliver on what I expect from a Goosebumps book. Let me know in the comments what you thought of How I Learned to Fly. Would you take on a life of fame and fortune? Where would you fly to? Is Wilson just Giga Chad? Also, what did you think of my flight horror clips this week? This was definitely one of the more challenging books to pick a theme and clips for. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.